I figured it'd be a good way to jump into helping people understand how to look at scientific journals and scientific studies and see what you should be analyzing and really try to figure out how to get the main takeaways really that's my main goal um, is to help people see how they can kind of uh, insert themselves in the scientific discussion in a smart way right so that's what i'm aiming for and that's what i'm hoping to do right now so my intention right is to look over this paper which is called repurpose antiviral drugs for covid19 some of them i i'm sure you've heard of before um and it's, you know, the interim WHO, World Health Organization, solidarity trial results. Uh, this is an interesting one, right? Because it looks at a few different drugs. As you can see here, um, the ones I'm sure you've heard of, remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, um, and then a couple you might not have, um, the ones that aren't quite in the news so often. And the purpose here was to look at drugs that have been approved for other uses and to see if they're good for uh, treating COVID-19. Let me turn down my mic a little bit. I think I might be peaking. But yeah, so that was the goal. Um, and this is the abstract here. So if you've never seen a scientific uh, journal before, right, or a journal publication, I should say, or a journal is, you know, a compilation of all these articles that come out um, every so often right usually periodically monthly quarterly um but if you've never seen one before it usually starts off with an abstract that has a few different sections or it's all written as one uh straight paragraph or so um this is in the journal of was new england journal of medicine uh you've probably heard of it before um it's one of the top ones So, you know, the background is the World Health Organization expert groups recommend mortality trials of four repurposed antiviral drugs. You got remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, and interferon beta 1a. Uh, and patients hospitalized with coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19. So, in this study, they randomly assigned inpatients. So, these are... Uh, We'll look later on in the in the article, but you know these were patients that were um, already in the hospital. They are already sick with COVID nineteen and already getting treatment for you know what we would call severe uh, severe COVID nineteen. Um, so they randomly assigned them between one of the drug drug regimens that was locally available. Um, so not, that's important, locally available. So not every drug is approved or um, accessible in every country, every hospital, um, that varies, right? You know, in the US, you, you know, there are drugs that we never actually see because they've never been approved or they've been approved for different uses. Um, so the intention to treat primary analyses examined, oops, yeah, I don't like that. Get rid of it. <laughs> um, in hospital mortality in the four pairwise comparisons of each trial drug and its controls. Um, so the drug available patient assigned to the same care without that drug. So this is important. This uh, usually in a drug trial, you will have a drug and a placebo. Right, the placebo looks um, looks kind of looks basically just like the drug, and both the the healthcare provider who's administering the drug um, and the and assessing the the patient, as well as the patient, neither of them know what the which one is the drug if they're receiving the drug or if they're receiving the placebo, which um, you know is usually saline. It depends what form it's in, if it's saline or a sugar pill or something like that. Um, because the placebo effect is very, very real. <laughs> and you can see that in drug trials where uh, people do better when they are in placebo than uh, receiving nothing. And that's a, a well-known uh, phenomenon. Okay, 
so we have uh you know that that's the basic uh study design and this is very important here so when you when you read uh any paper you want to look at the abstract and all pieces of it because every abstract is very important um, and everything they put in the abstract is important the this is limited space um this is very limited space and this is actually more um permissive than a lot of journals journals will tell you how much information uh, down to the character number that you're allowed to include. So, you know, it, make sure that when you look through anything, you want to read through the abstract, um, but to really get the, the nuts and bolts and um, to see what really happened, you have to read through the paper. You, there's no skipping through it. And the pap through the paper, you'll see, um, and I'll demonstrate right here, I started taking a first pass and then I decided to jump on the stream. Um, you'll see that there's like um, plenty of figures and stuff. And this is what helps you compare um, compare whatever you're looking at. Um, and it also helps you if you're well versed in the field of study. Um, a lot of times you'll you'll skip the abstract and everything you just kind of want to look at the results and look at the figures because um you already know all the background um to everything so let's look at the results at 405 hospitals and 30 countries so this is huge right this is a huge study um 1100 wait no 11,330 adults underwent randomization 2750 were assigned to receive remdesivir um, another almost 1,000 were on hydroxychloroquine, uh, 1,400 were on lopinavir uh, without interferon. I guess that's a, that's usually a, a combo, I guess, um, a combo of antivirals. And a little over 2,000 um, were assigned to interferon, which included 651 to interferon plus lopinavir. Yeah, so that's the combo I was just alluding to. Oops. Um, yeah, so this is crazy. <laughs> you can never see adherence this high and it must have been because, um, well, I'm guessing because this was in, administered in the hospital, right? Um, or at least they were, they were assigned to, um, patients in the hospital and also COVID-19 is scary, right? Uh, a lot of, um, I don't see dates on this yet. This came out in December. So, but really think about it. This disease hasn't been around that long. So, um, and obviously it's, it's sucked up all, well, I hate saying that. I don't want to say that. I was going to say suck up all the air. That's a horrible, um, metaphor to use. Um, but really it's, it's been the top of mind of everyone, especially in the healthcare community. Right. So, yeah, I guess the the point is that that's a that's a lot of adherence. That that means that people were ad literally adhering to their drug regimen. They were taking the drugs as prescribed um, throughout. So through midway through the treatment, um, with two to six percent crossover. Um, I, I'm not very sure what that means. Not very sure what oops that means. Um, maybe it means that s some patients were on one regimen and then crossed over to another. I'm unsure. That's my best guess. In total, 1,253 d deaths were reported. Um, that's unfortunate. The Kaplan-Meier 28-day mortality was... 11.8 percent so this is interesting this is it jumps right it's almost um four times as much right if the patient was already on a ventilator um that's unfortunate right so it seemed like during this time when patients were on ventilators they they were in bad shape right very bad shape um and 9.5 
percent otherwise. So 9.5 percent if they were not okay. Yeah. So it was a little lower if they were not on a ventilator, but it was already super high if they were on a ventilator already. So death occurred in 301 of 2743 patients. Yeah, so I'm not going to look at all of these right here. It's very important to, um, but I just want to get the gist of this right now. And I'm not going to be able to remember everything in my head. Right. So this is, you know, this is the, the hard outcome, the main finding that the authors wanted. Um, with rate ratios, which is a way of comparing two different um, treatments to see what the outcome is. Um, and the confidence interval, which is basically the statistics to make sure um, that describe which uh, whether or not the the difference is statistically significant. Um, and then you could say one is different than the other or not. Um, so no drug definitely reduced mortality overall or in any subgroup or reduced initiation of ventilation or hospitalization duration. That's that's unfortunate. Um, so these remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, and interferon regimens had little or no effect on hospitalized patients. So if they were already in the hospital, that's a, that's also very important, right? This was on hospitalized patients. So these were on, uh, patients who were already receiving hospital care and many of them, or at least a population of them were already on um, ventilators. Let me turn on my mic a bit. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay. So yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to talk through real quick. Um, so I went through the the abstract there, um, and then I had some comments throughout here. So I, I wish I could do it in order of these columns, but Adobe doesn't really work that way, unfortunately. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask in chat. Um, I'm kind of reading this suit for mostly the first time I scanned through it quickly before, but obviously there's a lot to understand and a lot to dissect. And this is not one drug. It's, uh, looking at four different treatments. So that is, um, that is sometimes difficult <laughs> to deal with. Sometimes difficult to deal with, for sure. Um, so when you go through, right, when you go through a paper, uh, they're usually broken down into somewhat digestible sections. And so depending on your information background, um, it's important to read some or all of these, right? So for example, I n I'm not a COVID-19 scientist. Um, I've studied other areas of biology, but this isn't really, um, my field. I'm, I don't know infectious disease really. Um, so it, it could be important for a background to, to read what the, this background is now, um, because it's been such in the, so high in the news, like it, this is pretty much, um, well known. But what I didn't know is that the, uh, WHO began a large, simple, I like simple, <laughs> you never see that. Large, simple, international, open label, randomized trial involving hospital inpatients to evaluate the effects of these four drugs on in-hospital mort mortality, yeah. Um, so the trial was adaptive, so that's cool, right? So um, this said that unpromising drugs could be dropped. So if the drugs look like they were having no effect or, or were being harmful, they would just drop the, the drug from the trial. Um, and it even says that three of these were eventually dropped from the trial, um, but others uh, will be added, including monoclonal antibodies. And I believe that's what Regeneron's uh, product is. I don't know if, I think it's a monoclonal antibody, um, but very helpful. Um, yeah, so once they give you the backgrounds, uh, this format that 
New England Journal of Medicine uses gives you, a, you know, a, a look into the trial design. Um, that's very important for um, comparing and understanding the context of what the results are. So this was done in adults, 18, um, 18 years of age or older, who were hospitalized and diagnosed with COVID-19 um, and were known to not have received any of the drug, uh, any of the trial drugs already, which is important, right? Uh, you don't want any of those confounding effects. So here, here they are. I kind of I've went over them before, um, and I told you that three of them were were eventually dropped. Um, two were in the summer, dropped in the summer, and one was this past fall. The last one was the um, interferon beta one, and I, I don't know much about interferon beta one. Um, I could look up all this. I probably should for the video I'm preparing for, but that's for later. Um, I did want to do a time check because it's getting a little late. And this is a nice cozy stream. So daily doses were those already used for other trials. Oh, I forgot to fire up. I apologize if you've been talking to me on um, in chat because I forgot to look at my chat. So let's bring that up just in case. I'm so sorry if you're actually watching. Hi, I'm here. That's me. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. Bum, ba, dum, bum, bum. What song is that? What song is that? Oh my goodness. Is that American Gladiators? <laughs> Does anyone know if that's American Gladiators? <laughs> it's going to drive me crazy now. Um, okay. So the controls, right? The controls for a drug uh, were patients assigned to the standard care at a time and place in which that drug was locally available, um, which is interesting. So it's not necessarily, um, I don't think it's, it's not necessarily the, the same hospital. Yeah. Okay. Assignment. That's interesting. Cause so <laughs> it's not like in the hospital, there was one patient who got, um, one patient who got, let's just say the interferon and then another patient in the next room who didn't. Um, it seems like maybe, you know, some hospitals got, you know, used one or two of the treatments and then they had another hospital, um, maybe even in the same city, uh, that used a couple of different treatments. And then, um, at each of them, they had, you know, they paired uh, a patient to each of those arms who received standard of care, which means not receiving any of the new drugs, but, you know, being on a ventilator and doing whatever else that is usually, uh, re basically up until this point, what they had been doing and what, uh, the hospital protocols and health officials decided was the best, uh, way of treating the the patient. So, yeah, that's interesting. I haven't really seen any of that um, design before, but maybe it's common. Maybe it's common in big ones. Um, each comparison between a trial drug and its control, however, was evenly randomized. Oh, hence there was. That's that's important too, right? Hence there was partial overlap among the four control groups. All right. So this, you know, to take a step back, it's really to understand um, how we can contextualize what the results are. That's the main goal of looking at the trial design and looking at the methods and seeing what the patients look like, which we'll look at um, a little later as well. Okay. 
okay um and then there's there's a bunch here about like what the doses are you know that's important but usually it's um it's been standardized it, they used from what i can tell um actually I, I read this before too they used whatever the um previous or main indication or main dosage is for that drug in whatever uh disease that they they usually treat um, these are all antiviral so some kind of viral infection yeah so so that should be uh standard right and that's why when when some people were saying that hydroxychloroquine is safe um you know that that could have been true um for the patients it was used in before right um at the dose that it was used in before um and it could possibly be true for COVID-19. I mean, the study says it doesn't add any benefit and it was dropped from it, but you know, just keep that in mind. So there's a difference between being being safe and there's a difference between that and uh, being efficacious and, and working well for that disease. <sighs> boom, boom. Oh, it's already midnight. I didn't even finish my my tea. It's um hibiscus. Tastes good. Dumb. Yeah, so there's outcomes here. Um I don't know if there's always outcomes. I, I don't tend to see that, but again, I don't usually study um, studies like this. Um, I don't look at studies that often that the death is the outcome. Um, you know, you could do that for, I guess, um, you do that a lot with, I guess, cancers and, and you know, terminal illnesses. Um, I study a lot of diabetes and obesity, which are obviously very important important diseases um, but usually you can't um, usually you don't look at at um, mortality based on them okay and then you know although no placebos were used appropriate analyses of the secondary outcomes can still be informative I yeah so <laughs> da, 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 da. So there's the oversight and funding, which for this, I'm guessing was kind of um, complicated. WHO. Up, up, up. So let's get to the good stuff, right? Um, okay. And, and again, let me point out that the statistical analysis part um, is very important. I am not a statistician, and I don't think most scientists are really. We hardly <laughs> no okay i'm generalizing I'll, I'll talk for myself um i generally do not go too far beyond a p-value and in any of these studies um you have bio statisticians and um you know full professionals whose job it is to run the statistics on on this and uh, make sure that's done correctly um and that it's accurate and that it makes sense for what you're studying um so usually a scientist will, or, you know, a scientific group, which studies like this, um, employ will, will also work with statisticians, um, when they're writing up these, these, uh, reports. So with that said, I'm going to just breeze through that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. It's a lot here. All right. Okay, so important part. So this is this is what the study was, right? From March 22nd to October 4th of this year, uh, 2020, the year of our Lord, uh, a total of 11,330 patients were entered in the trial from 405 hospitals in 30 countries. Yep, we read that in, if you remember back, um, in the abstract, right? So, so in, 
in articles like this and reports like this, one of the first results is usually uh, what the patient population was. Oh, I'm getting a fussy baby. Uh, <laughs> what the patient population was and what it looked like um, and how many patients there were and you know where they were, things like that, and how many received the, the treatment. So it's a summary of uh, right here it says patient characteristics and is adherence. Adherence isn't always one of them. Patient characteristics is important because you want to make sure all the groups that are receiving the drugs, um, you know, you you don't want um, one group to be like 95% white um, and the other white males and then like a, the control group be like 40% um, black females. Like that, that is not obviously... Um, a good control because it because it really doesn't reflect the population um, well it depends where you are but it doesn't reflect um, between the two groups it's not really a good comparison if your patient populations look and you know not only look different but are different in some ways okay so a total of 2750 patients were assigned to all these drugs that we talked about before. <sighs> For each drug, patient characteristics were well balanced, right? You wanna, I mean, I, I've never seen a paper where they said like, it was not well balanced. You need a well balanced population to say anything about anything. Uh, deaths were at a medium of day eight and wow wait so the median that's unfortunate so like what that means right it was that um, after the initiation of the drug um whenever it was right so some patients just to be clear some patients um right started on march 22nd with whatever treatment um other patients started probably March uh, 30th, right? Other patients started July 8th, and each of those patients was tracked for 28 days, um, unless they, of course, um, passed away. So it, what it's saying here was that after the initiation, um, the median uh, patients really passed if they were to die um died at day eight um in a cortal range four to 14 yeah so um they happened to die kind of relatively soon after after that you know within a week or so a week to two weeks um discharges were at medium day eight two so yeah i mean that's right so that's basically saying people either um you know this is averages, essentially. This is looking at populations of people. But people tended to either die on day eight or were discharged on day eight. Uh, table one also shows adherence for remdesivir that the scheduled treatment duration was 10 days. Um, yep, yep, yep. So that's all about how the treatment was really working um, for the patients and how they took them so not working but like how they they took the drug um and what their schedules looked like there so for each pairwise comparison of a drug and its control um as control figure two and figures s1 through s5 show the kaplan meyer track plots okay so let's go to that because um that's important along with the rate ratios for death stratified according to age and ventilation okay this is where all those like statistics come in handy all those things i don't know how to do um but once you do them and once you actually analyze a data set in a way that's useful um you get things like this, which are really nice and really show you. So um, in hospital 
mortality. Um, so what you want to do when you see figures like this is usually um, if it's if it's in a you know a nicely formatted journal, um, usually what there is is that uh, there's this caption here and it'll give you a bit of information. Now some will give you like a ton of information and some will just uh, hold it back and, and discuss it a, a little bit and just tell you literally what you're looking at. So shown are Kaplan-Meier graphs of in-hospital mortality at any time. I'm comparing each treatment with its control without standardization for any initial patient characteristics. Insets show the same data on an expanded y-axis. Okay. Okay, so really all it's saying is that when you look, let's, uh, I'm gonna mark this up, look at that. When you look at this, um, this data and this data are exactly the same. It's just that this is zoomed in, this top one is zoomed in. This one on, oh, nope, they're both the red. Okay, I thought I could just change one. I can't. Um, yeah, so just this one, this top right one, it's zoomed in. You can see that the axis is zero uh, to 15% as opposed to um, the zero to 100% there. So let's get rid of those. Um, very good. So when you're looking at these graphs, right, the the intention is to be able to see differences over time of of what happens to, you know, basically the patients. Uh, and it's starting over here. Zero. Um, it's looking at, you know, basically every day. So zero. Uh, um, basically, what it's saying is that, you know, there was like, let's just say points let's just say 0.25% mortality on day one. Um, and it climbs up until there was about, you know, something like 12% mortality at the end of 28 days. And you can see, you know, which group was, was uh, basically dying faster or slower. And you see these kinds of studies or these kinds of graphs often, uh, like I was saying, in and things that are terminal Ill illnesses or, or um, things like that, where sometimes I've, I think I've seen them more of a survival curve. So it's, um, you know, it'll say survival, percent survival on it. You, it'll start off, you know, at 100%. And then over time, um, it could be days, it could be years. Uh, but over time, you'll see it decrease because, you know, not all of us no one really gets out of this right so um but yeah it's the same concept here and what's cool is that it, when you zoom in like like this right from instead of looking at the zero to 100 percent, when you look at the zero to 15 percent graph um you can start to see separation now what you have to do is look at the um statistics afterwards hey how's it going man i like that face uh, GM Lord. <laughs> I don't I don't know whose emoji that is. That's not me. But I appreciate you uh, saying hi. Um, if you have any questions or want to say anything, feel free to say so in the chat. But I'm just going through this paper, kind of uh, getting ready to just make a quick YouTube video on how to look at scientific papers and, and uh, understand what you should be doing in them. And really, obviously, COVID-19 has been interesting for this um, in general. Ah, uh, just recently joined. Thank you. Well, thanks for saying hi. Um, that's cool. I, I think I've been talking mostly myself, but that's fine by me. Um, because a lot of this is practicing for uh, video creation, like I was saying. Or maybe if this goes well. Hey, thank you, dude. Thanks for following. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm a, I'm a medical communications scientist and studied more biology in my background. But I figured... What way to get people into understanding how to read and, and understand scientific journals than diving into COVID-19 stuff, which people are interested in, right? 
hey thanks i appreciate it do you do any science or anything or are you just uh an interested spectator lurking not lurking joining in on uh, science and technology channels um so these graphs you can see here are just kind of comparing four different drugs. Uh, this is a study done by the World Health Organization um, looking at antiviral drugs that were um, basically repurposed for COVID-19. So the thought was these work for other diseases. Let's try them out on other things. Cool. Just a spectator. Hey, I appreciate that. That's really um, cool. Actually, I appreciate that more because we need more people who are interested in, um, in science and you know, it, people say it's not easy and it, you know, it's not the easiest thing, but like, uh, most people don't try. Um, I mean, there are a lot of things I need to try harder at, like, uh, probably carpentry and fixing stuff in my house. So, you know, I, we're all guilty. <laughs> um, so yeah, the whole idea of this paper was, and this huge study across the world was to look at whether or not uh, drugs could be repurposed from other um, repurposed from other purposes um, for treating other viral infections to see if it would work for COVID-19. And really the gist of it was that um, the four that they studied here, remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, which you probably have heard of these two if you've watched the news at all, um, that they didn't really have any change over the control, which was, you know, how people were being treated without those drugs um, instead of a placebo, which is what we usually try to do. Um, and these other two drugs also were not. Um, interferons, I, I know a, a big, um, interferons, a, a big a antiviral drug. Um, and it seems like there was some kind of Compa combine, combined use of, of them, uh, Lopinavir and interferon. I don't know these drugs that well. I'm not a <laughs> COVID scientist, but um, yeah. And then you get to to figures like this, which um, are helpful, but uh, don't really uh, tell you what the outcome. You know, it tells you outcomes at, basically stratified at different ages. So you, you see here um, for remdesivir, if the patients were under 50, um, the active treatment was number of ports death, uh, sorry, number of deaths reported um, over the number of patients. So uh, if there, people were under 50, about 7% or so um, unfortunately died um, it, and it goes up by age class. And then what's really um, big here was that for COVID-19, if um, and all these studies were done on patients who are already in the hospital and already undergoing treatment. So uh, if they were on a ventilator, <clears throat> excuse me, on a ventilator already, um, about 10 percent, 10 to 11 percent passed away um, within 28 days. And if they're all already on a ventilator, um, you can see that that um, skyrocketed there. So, um, right. So those percentages, the 43 and the 37.8, um, those people passed away. And that was pretty, it seemed, I think, consistent across the board. So somewhere between 30 and 40 percent usually um, and somewhere between like six and nine percent or something like that. So that's the big takeaway. The big takeaway of this paper was that the other drugs, um, basically the, the drugs that they looked at, the four here, um, we'll just go back to the abstract. Do you, have you ever looked at a scientific journal article before by any chance? Um, I know sometimes they're hard to get to. Uh, the cool thing with COVID-19, if there is a cool thing, is that um, so many of the studies are open access and so you can just kind of uh look at it yeah i mean i wouldn't <laughs> i wouldn't do this for fun necessarily but um why do i have no views that, that's a good question i mean i'm new <laughs> this is one of my first streams doing this so um but you know i think it's going kind of well and it's kind of fun talking with you and with no one um so i'm gonna work on advertising it a bit better um and you can watch some of my stuff on YouTube. I'm kind of dabbling around with a, a lot of stuff there, but 
Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Dude, your emoji game is on point. Um, I need to, to get into it a little more. It's been a while. Um, I, I streamed StarCraft like way back in the day. If I don't know if you're a big gamer or not, but... Um, and then I kind of stopped. Seems professional. Me? Well, I'm a little professional sometimes. Um, but I'm also wearing my Marvel Super Heroes t-shirt now, so... Um, not great. <laughs> not great for the professionality, but... Yeah, I kind of... I. I do do this professionally in a way. Um, for my main job, I I um, do science communication. So, so I'm used to this. I'm used to trying to. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I do. I I am a little professional. That's true. So hey, appreciate you. Thanks for stopping by. Um, I had fun going over this, and I hope you learned a little bit. But. If uh, if you're ever interested, feel free to follow my chat. I I don't know if I'll be streaming at after midnight my time like it is now um, too often. You're just young trying to learn English. Oh, what's your what's your language? Where are you from? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm very curious, but I just need to know before I hop off. Um, I wish I knew. Um, my mom's Puerto Rican, so I I apparently knew Spanish way before. Okay. Arabic, very cool. I mean, Arabic's a huge one. I wish I knew Arabic too. It's such a, a cool language, and I know, um, you know, obviously it's a huge language around the world too. So I wish I knew that. Ah, you know, Arab Emirates. I had, um, yeah, I had friends who whose parents worked there. Um, I forgot. I think they did stuff with oil or whatever, which, you know, a big thing there. So I hope you're doing well out there. Um, it's uh, probably a lot earlier. <laughs> you're enjoying your, your um, what, Wednesday morning? But, you know, have a good one, dude. And uh, thanks for jumping in my chat. Really appreciate it. I'll talk to you later, okay?